Hello, I'm John Bailey, and I'm here at DDW uh, as a representative of the editorial board of Gastrointestinal Endoscopy to interview the authors of some recently accepted uh, papers uh, in GIE. And it's my great pleasure today to introduce Dr. Michelle Cahelli, who is Professor of Medicine and Director of Endoscopy at Weill Cornell uh, Medical Center in New York. Dr. Cahelli is uh, very well known uh, worldwide really as a therapeutic endoscopist and uh, I think it's fair to say a lot of exciting stuff is coming out of his unit these days so we're pleased you came to talk to us about this paper and I'm going to read this because I always mess this up uh, the article is entitled endoscopic gallbladder drainage how does it compare with percutaneous drainage so I will be asking you why you thought to do this and the results and outcome uh, I also want you to be thinking about what's the impact of this on surgeons. You know, surgeons don't like us messing in their territory. In fact, I remember um, one of the pioneers of ERCP, Joe Geenan, telling me that surgeons actually told him when he started doing ERCP, you've no business in the biliary tree, that's our turf, we're not going to back you up if something bad happens. So I'll be very interested to take a few minutes at the end to find out how your surgical colleagues are mm -hmm. reacting to this. So. Um, this is a, a big uh, study with some uh, heavy hitter names on it, uh, but you uh, were the senior author, and so thank you for coming and, and talking to us about it. So tell us what the impetus for doing this study was first. Thank you for having me, John. Oh, welcome. It's a really pleasure to be here. Um, oftentimes, uh, as gastroenterologists dealing with pancreatic opioid diseases, we get actually consultation for patients that are extremely sick and have cholecystitis. One of the very first things that I taught my advanced fellow in my team is if at any moment the patient can get surgery, the patient should get surgery. We really come in play when actually the patient is not a surgical candidate. Then comes the moment to decide how can we offer this patient the best strategy. If you have this poor patient who has unresectable cancer, and obviously this patient is only thinking about having the most decent quality of life. An endoscopic solution may actually provide him this. And this is exactly what we wanted to do. So to, to play the devil's advocate slightly, we, we already have a percutaneous procedure, which is cholecystostomy, which is quite useful in sick patients with a hot gallbladder. So why do we need an endoscopic alternative? Excellent question. And I think if you have a patient that is moribund, that is unable to sustain any kind of procedure and need a quick intervention, definitely a percutaneous drainage is acceptable. But what about the patient that's going to get a chemo radiation protocol? It's going to be there maybe for a year or two, and you've seen those patients. Those patients that typically come back to us to follow them up for instance, check their biliary stents or things like that. And all they can keep on complaining about when they see us as an outpatient is about the percutaneous drain. And actually the number of sessions that they have to still undergo to make sure that the catheter placed percutaneously remain patent. And this is how I got the idea. I said maybe we should offer to those patients something else than just a percutaneous drain that will be bound to them until the end of life. Well, I, I agree with that entirely because patients with percutaneous drains, they're always coming out, they're always leaking, they get infected, they get blocked up, so usually that's the, the misery that they have is dealing with those. So uh, so tell us how you set this study up. Uh, uh, was it prospective, retrospective, and uh, then you could tell us what the results were. Exactly. So um, it was very hard when you come to an institution which actually ha has no idea about endoscopic drainage of gallbladder to do a randomized controlled trial, which would have been obviously the best solution. So what we decided to do is anytime we get a consultation about a patient having acute cholecystitis, we will basically include them in our registry. We will proceed first with endoscopic drainage transpapillary. That was our gold standard. And this is before the era of lumina posing middle stent. So we'll do the ERCP, which are a transpapillary drainage, and if we fail, and only if we fail, we will then proceed with an eos gather drainage. So this is the putting a stent through the cystic duct into the gallbladder? Correct. Okay. Yeah. And if we fail that technique, which sometimes you know, is you know, impossible to be done because the cystic duct is involved by cancer, or the cystic duct is extremely tortuous, 
then we will offer to the patient an EOS gathered drainage. This is before the era, I insist, of lumen opposing metal stents, which I think is completely changing the game. So, uh, what were the results of the study? It you was did a retrospective yes. analysis of, of data over what kind of length yeah. of time was It was about uh, two years, two years and a half approximately, and we made sure that the patients were matched. So we, we actually were able to get into the database of our colleagues, the radiologists, mm -hmm. and we look at a group of patients that actually were matched to our endoscopy uh, patient because mm -hmm. you need to have the same disease, etiology, age, gender, etc., and staging, of course. So once we matched them, we looked at two things. We looked at the mobility of those patients, the efficacy of the treatment, and then any kind of data regarding the number of sessions, the length of stay, and how long it took for the patient to leave the hospital. And we were really surprised by the results. For, in terms of efficacy, the two techniques are totally similar, which goes back to your point, if the patient is extremely moribund, and you with a quick action, a percutaneous drainage is definitely an option. But when it comes to the number of sessions, you have way much more session in the percutaneous drainage because those patients have to come back to have the drain checked, flush, change sometimes. And then in terms of quality of life, the quality of life was dramatically improved into the endoscopy group simply because they have, just to start with, less pain. If you remember all those patients that come through the percutaneous drainage, they, they really have pain. We're not even talking about infection or things like that. So I imagine that accessing the gallbladder is, is a chip shot through the duodenal wall. I mean, you see it right there. There's not really no vessels and stuff in the way. So it's mm -hmm. technically quite easy to do. Technically, yeah. it was easy. But talking with our surgeon as we start doing this, we actually learn from them something very interesting. For the very few patients that end up becoming resectable, getting chemo radiation, and this is not in the study because this is like really long-term data, they actually prefer us if we have to create a transenteric anastomosis, the anastomosis to be transgastric, because it's much easier for them to close the stomach than to close the duodenum. That's very interesting. So we shifted completely our paradigm for those very few patients mm. that can I get downstaging with chemo radiation and ended up getting their Whipple to do actually a drainage straight ahead from the, the stomach. Well, that's a very important, important point. My last question is when you're talking about the, the transmural uh, stents. Now, these are, the, uh, these are metal stents with a big flange in each right. end. Is so that correct? Before the era of the lumen opposing metal stents, we just, as you know, got approved a year and a year and a half ago uh, and got bought by Boston Scientific recently, the Axios stents. We were using fully covered metal stent with fins, right. the viable stent from uh, ConMet. And I have to say, those stents provide very nice results, but the limitation is a diameter of 10 millimeter. Mm -hmm. So we used to place those. But I think with the, the, the apparition and the use of lumina posing metal stent, this whole thing gonna change. But it's very important to use that information from the surgeon to include in, in our future algorithm. And these newer stents you're describing, these are the same kind that are now being advocated for pseudocyst drainage, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Well, it's a very exciting study, and I, you know, I've, I have a personal campaign against percutaneous drainage because I've never p met a patient with a percutaneous biliary or gallbladder drain who didn't, or wasn't absolutely miserable with pain. And so if you can do this and improve their quality of life, more power to you. So, Michelle, thank you very much for coming. Thank you, John. It was a pleasure. And uh, we'll look forward to some more studies on this. Thank you so much.